How to increase your borrowing capacity. This is a question a lot of property investors have had on their mind in recent times. I guess it's a real problem for people who've chosen their vehicle to retirement to be predominantly property focused. Because in recent times, skyrocketing prices, decreasing yields and rising interest rates have created a lot of challenges. In today's video, I've got Stewie Bayless here from SGB Finance to tackle this topic. We're going to start off with some quick wins. Then we're going to touch on some things you can do in terms of structuring up your loans that can help you improve your borrowing power. We're then going to uncover this seemingly massive secret, which has actually been around forever, which can ensure you won't be spending all this time figuring out how to get your next property to add to your portfolio. For those who want to grow their portfolios beyond what's considered normal, this is for you. G'day, Will. Good to see you again. Uh, good to see you, mate. I think last time we were chatting and we, I can't remember who brought it up. I think you brought it up and we said it. You know, we've got this client who they're capped out on their current borrowing. I thought, well, this is going to be a great conversation. This is great fodder for property investors yeah. out there because let's be honest, interest rates are really high compared to what they were two years ago. Investors are out there everywhere trying to figure out what they do next. So let's have a chat about how people can increase their buying power. Yeah, well, you know, you see a lot of those articles in the property investor magazines and a lot of websites these days. And I bought a hundred properties in two years and whatever these extraordinary headlines are. And the question for a lot of property investors is, how did they do that? You know, you and I went around and brainstormed a couple of ideas of methods that we've used to push people beyond the envelope of where they were at. Before we jump into that, I want to talk about some basic things people can do. So maybe some borrowing capacity 101. So quick wins that people can do. Maybe yeah. they're applying for something right now. Get the low-hanging fruit, mate. Yes. Low-hanging fruit. That is the one. What do you reckon is the lowest hanging fruit in terms of if I'm wanting to increase my borrowing power, what's the, what's the most normal things you see? Yeah, the, the biggest one that I see is the just some of the wild expenses like credit card limits. Can they be lowered? Do you really need that $20,000 credit card when you're a nurse at a hospital i don't know just you know like a, a standard kind of job that it doesn't take you around the world or fly or something like that that you do you really need a twenty thousand dollar credit limit so there's often conversations that we would have with clients to say can you lower that to five grand or two grand or something that just gets you out of trouble makes you be able to afford the expense that you're looking at but at the same time you don't have that massive expense on your monthly living expenses so people may not know, we'll, we'll dive into this a little bit, but lenders ask us to cost out the limit of the credit card. So say it's a thousand bucks limit, then we would have to use $38 per month added to your monthly living expenses. Now extrapolate that over a $10,000 or a $20,000 credit card, it becomes significant. That minimizes your borrowing capacity. To me, that's the lowest hanging fruit. A second lowest hanging fruit is one that I get all the time. <laughs> Car loans. I don't know what people are doing buying new cars, but I would say first off, your choices play in a big impact. So if you want a sixty thousand dollar car, you know, a first home buyer or whoever you are, and you've got a choice to buy a second hand car at twenty thousand dollars, well, the difference between you buying a twenty thousand dollar car loan and a sixty thousand dollar car loan is going to be night and day. It's like it's a massive difference. And actually, over the past few years. That's probably one of the major things that have stopped people, especially from getting the second property I've found. I've found quite a lot of people can get by getting in the market with current debts already. Not, not that you want to do that. But what I've found is that once it comes to growing portfolios, it's a massive handbrake. Got it. Like it. The monthly living expenses is one that we see a lot. I think you see that too, Will. Yep. No, pretty straightforward if you're blowing your money on stuff all the time. Believe it or not, Uber Eats, for some people, unknowingly, is a massive amount of money. People get takeout all the time to the point where it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds that's takeout in general, possibly thousands of dollars. I've seen it over a grand regularly. A month? A month. Wow. I'm just, yeah, <laughs> crazy. People don't cook. Yeah. But obviously that's going to have a massive impact on, on what you can do. One of the things I like to look at in terms of conceptually about investing is it's always a trade-off between having stuff now and having stuff for the future. So investing is obviously yeah. for, for your future and retirement. Generally what I find is if people want all the stuff now, they're spending all the money, they've got the car loans, they've got all of this, that's fine. But you're making a choice to have something now versus have something in the future. And at the end of the day, it's helpful to have, to have that mindset to go, all right, well, what do I what do I want to do? And for some people, it's going to be, okay, well, let's just spend all the money now. That's cool. Do that for another five years. Maybe you're a bit younger. And then 
time to get serious and, and buckle down. But I think that's a good way to generalize everything, especially when it comes to investing and your borrowing power as well. The, the phrase that came up for me when you were saying that was delayed gratification. So the gratification happens now if you buy the car now, or if you take the credit card out now, or if you go and spend a thousand bucks on Uber Eats per month or whatever that version is for you. And, you know, we need some lifestyle. We need some, we need to enjoy some things. But like you say, there is a line where you say, we've got to get something done for the future. We've got to lay down some foundations and so on, buy the home, buy the investment properties, all those sorts of things versus just blow it now. So there's a very reasonable thing in there. And wherever we can delay our gratification is usually better and put it into a, a growing asset rather than a diminishing asset like a car or a Barbie doll, whatever it is. <laughs> and, you know, whatever those things are, wherever we can delay gratification is better for the future. I love it. Let's go one level up. Let's. This is one that a lot of people, they've got emotional attachments to they're investing. I get it a lot. They might have one investment or two investment properties, but they're losing money. Like yeah. the reality is Victoria has been that way a lot and maybe places like New South Wales as well, where people could cop the negative cash flow before, but now rates are a lot higher. Mm. But the thing that does to your borrowing power is it actually, it actually hurts you a lot because that property is losing money. So depending on the on the properties you that you have and what their numbers look like, they can actually be really hurting hurting your borrowing capacity. And the reason why I say people get emotionally attached is because sometimes I go to them and say, look, maybe it's worth consider selling this property because that might free you up to, to do other things. What I've learned is that people don't like that a lot of the time. <laughs> Not for any reason apart from that they just like that property, they're attached to it. Do you see that? Much. I, I probably see it less. A lot of my investors are pretty hard nosed, and I, I think that might be a bit because of me. I'm I'm pretty hard nosed about things. Like if it's if the property is not working, if the numbers aren't working, get rid of it. It's a bit like a, a garbage asset. Even if you had any garbage asset, if it's if it's just not working and there's no end in sight to it not looking good, why wouldn't you just cut it loose and get and improve the asset and hold a better asset. Even if there's a little bit of cost in that, I think it's a better idea. Yeah, I really like the idea of cutting them off. I do have people who say, oh, no, but I just love that. And there might even sometimes be some familial attachment, like it was gifted to them or it was, you know, something like that. I'm not sure the way around that actually will. I think if people are attached and you make them aware that they've got a choice to improve the asset or to just love the property, then just love the property, but know you're just loving the property, I think is the answer. But where possible, get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> so before we move on to the major thing that's kind of, we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, I think where you're going to provide a case study of, of a client, I think. Oh, we'll soon find out. The one thing I wanted to discuss beforehand was actually restructuring the debt. I'll try to explain this without getting too technical for the average client out there, but there's, there's a difference between conforming debt and non-conforming uh, or lenders, conforming right. lenders and non-conforming lenders. So yes. they have particular regulations, rules, guidelines, all of that sort of stuff, which they can operate by. Generally, what you'll find with your conforming lenders, which is your normal banks, your big four, your other second tier lenders, they've got to conform to particular requirements and you're going to get capped out there and all of those lenders they might be slightly different but actually they're all of the same if you take enough lenders and kind of generalize them where you can get bigger gains is by going to someone like a non-conforming lender which has different rules on how they can assess income and expenses one specific situation that i have and scenarios that i use are when a client might have two investment properties and they're capped out, so they can't borrow anymore. The old lending ceiling. One thing they can do, because as they're playing that game, at the start, for your borrowing capacity, actually princ principal and interest is, is, is the best way to go. Because if you've got a 30-year loan, you're paying principal and interest, your loan repayments, you know, they're at a particular level. But if you take a 30-year loan out and then you decide to do interest only, which is what a lot of uh, property investors do, the bank comes in and then goes, okay, you got your five years interest only, but now you've got to repay that loan over, over 25, 25 years. Yeah. yeah. And so that boosts your expenses, which drops your borrowing capacity. Some lenders, however, non-conforming lenders can take your other debt that you've got. Let's say you've got your other two investment properties 
and let's say they're interest only, they can take them based purely on the interest only repayment, sometimes plus a little bit. But using those lenders actually allows you to potentially extend your borrowing power to that next property and that next one after. Do you do much of that? Yeah, I wanted to jump in there and say, this is the technical part of this. Some lenders will take, will stress any debt at 25 years principal and interest repayments. No matter what their actual repayment is, we have to take a 25 year principal and interest repayment on that loan. And then they put that repayment in there, even though it's not true. Whereas what Will's talking about is there's a couple of lenders who will say, whatever your actual repayment is, we'll take that. And if that's 30 years and interest only or five years interest only, that is a much lower repayment than 25 years and principal and interest. Therefore, the borrowing capacity goes up. So we can use these ticks and trips and tricks and tips to maximize borrowing capacity and squeeze out you know, more properties than if you didn't do that. I just wanted to state that some take 25 years P&I and some will take current IO. I think we've covered pretty well on a couple of things people can do in terms of structuring. There's one structure to increase your borrowing power that often gets overlooked, but it's coming more in favor now just because I think more of the times are calling for it and people are more amenable to switching the their plan or their strategy. Stu, why don't you tell us about your particular situation that you've had um, with the recent client? And we maybe we'll use that as a case study to explain how this how this works. Yeah, so you and I were talking a bit earlier about some strategies that we've seen extend people out a fair way longer than we really would have expected if they were just investing by themselves. And then you also brought up the land tax issue, which we might cut back to you about that later on. Not that we can give advice on that area, but it's, um, it can be an extremely road bump hurdle kind of thing, land tax, that people don't see coming at them until they hit those hurdles. And then it's there's a bill to pay and it's expensive. So we've, we've had lots of borrowers who have got to the point where they held a number of assets in their own. And then you can start to look at more complex structures like companies as trustees for trusts, and also just straight out trusts themselves or actually purchasing in other companies. So we always like to make sure that we make the distinction between the individual themselves and then the entity, which is the company. They're all separate entities. And so therefore, governments and banks all look at each of those individuals as separate to just the individual. So if we're talking about a company purchasing, you're probably the director of that company and then the company can go ahead and purchase. What we've found is that if we can get the accountant to agree, and if this is actually true, that each of those other entities, like if this person owns a company over here and a company here and a trust here, if all of the expenses are held inside of those companies and they pay for their own expenses and they earn money by themselves, accountants can write off on those as being able to handle, well, you know, in the industry, we use the term wash your face. Have you heard that one before? Wash its own no, face? I haven't actually. No. Okay. Well, there you go. There's one for you. So is that trust washing its own face or is that company washing its own face? If, if it is, then what we can do is put those debts aside and we don't have to we don't have to talk about those debts in what we call our servicing calculators. And then all we have to do is any debts in personal names and any debts in the new entity that we're purchasing the new property in, they have to be taken into servicing, but not these ones over here. So there's a bit of a high level trick there that has got people far where they may have been in the first place. That takes some work with your accountant to make sure that there's actually capacity inside of each of those other entities that we're not taking take into account that they are washing their own face. Yeah. It, so, sound, Will? it sounded good. There's probably, like to the viewer hearing this, they've probably got two or three questions in their head and probably more. They're, they're head probably ringing going, okay, how, do, how does this actually work? Wait, wait what? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, the, the things I find with it, there's probably two main things. So the reason why people can't automatically switch to this, they've got too much existing debt. Right, So they've still yep. got too much existing debt in your own name. So when you go for that, let's say you want to buy the next property, the property goes into whatever, it goes into a company name or trust name. The lender still wants to know all about your finances. And if you have too 
higher level of debt, it's still potentially going to be a hindrance to you getting the next loan. So mm-hmm. this strategy needs to be played, like it needs to be tactical. So what I was saying to you with the, in Victoria, the land tax at the moment, right. there's a lot of yeah. uncertainty because it's just changed. But also I think reading between the lines, a lot of investors here feel that it's changed once. What's stopping it from changing next year? Like our budget black hole, no, not many Victorians actually understand it. It's set to blow out, but that's what we're getting told. Obviously, you know, I'm sure it's the same everywhere else in Australia. Whenever they tell you something, double it and that's going to be closer. Victoria's got a real problem and investors can feel this because they've they've changed a lot of rental laws. They've done a lot of changes in the last few years. So it actually does suit, like I'm I'm getting people more amenable to going, all right, well, let's look at selling down our existing portfolio. What that does is reduce, obviously you're wiping out the debts on your investment properties, but what quite a lot of people have is a lot of cash left over so they can wipe out debt in their own name. No. Right, no. so they've effectively got, let's say, zero percent as a case study. That gives them a lot of borrowing power, right? So they've solved the borrowing power issue there. So now they can go and purchase the properties under a structure. Restart. 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 The structure. Yeah. The only problem there is you got to know what you're doing, and what I say by that is because that entity where you've got the property or, or multiple properties under has to actually be making money. Yeah. It has to be paying for itself. It has to be cash flow positive. Because at the end of the day, the accountant's verifying that entity is looking after itself. So the- Washing its face. It's washing its face. <laughs> so those liabilities, everything about all the numbers to do with that entity getting put to a side. I think that's one thing most people actually think they overestimate how good they are at doing it. But I look at it and I don't know about you. But because I've been in this business for a long time, I'm skeptical about a lot of stuff. And that's one of those things where I, I, would, I would say, hey, well, maybe put someone else in place, like a buyer agent that's experienced with finding cash flow positive properties rather than leave it up to yourself. Because if you stuff it up, if done all of this stuff, it obviously costs money to put these things in place. I guess what I'm trying to say is, if you decide to implement a strategy, you sell down existing properties, you're going to have possibly tax events, let's let's call it that. You've come all this way, you set up all these structures, you're paying these accounts for everything. You want to make bloody sure that what you're doing is working. Again, I think we talked about last week, it's just putting the right people in place to ensure that these things get done. Yeah, we, we talked about the team last week and that's crucial to us. Like we really, uh, both of us would advise to get the most qualified team that you can on board and one that you can really connect to as well. Oh, I must have going to say earlier. I won't yeah, your your high level structure thing, I, we've used that to a great uh, advantage for a number of our clients. I really like your idea about selling the properties. If you've bought them in your personal names, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're coming to that tax, uh, that land tax threshold, maybe considering selling up that portfolio and paying off your owner-occupied debt, remembering that owner-occupied debt is non-tax deductible. Debt in for investment purposes, you can take the interest component for tax deductions. That's not tax advice, but go see your accountant. And then restarting the whole process again in other entities can be an excellent way to do it. I love the idea of getting rid of owner-occupied debt. I guess it comes down to like for me personally, when you start getting into these conversations with people, it comes down to what do you want? And I don't know about you, but I just like people when they have a concrete vision of what they want in the future. Obviously, things change throughout life, but well, so- the, be- the better vision you have for what you want and where you need to be at by retirement age, for example, the better you can make a plan around it. Because I've seen clients where they want to do stuff that's way more complex than what they actually need to do. As a broker helping people through people changing plans, it doesn't work if you're doing stuff and you're doing stuff on the run. You're better off figuring out this stuff before you start as best as you possibly can because you know things change really quick these days. The reason you do that is exactly the same thing I said before. You don't want to get halfway in or one year in and spend all this money before you realize, oh no, now I want to do something else. That's the only caveat to to all of this stuff. And I kind of get the feeling that we've had a good run. The economy's had a good run, so to speak. It doesn't feel that way, but it it actually has. And I kind of feel like people are a bit complacent about how they think about their future. And I think starting with the end in mind is a really important part of all of this. It's pretty fair. You wouldn't want to go and spend a couple of thousand dollars on setting up complex structures and realize that all you wanted to do was buy one property or something like that. It really wouldn't be worth that unless you had some sort of other asset protection type thing in mind. But to buy, you know, if you're a standard kind of PAYG employee, buying one property, it's 
probably not worth spending the money on complex structures for that. Having said all of that, my, a lot of the clients that I would use that strategy with ent- other entities washing their own faces would be there's developers, multiple property owners, like upwards of five kind of people. You know, it can be something if you're a motivated person who wants to just keep pushing the limits, then it's definitely out there and it's definitely doable. There is one other thing I'll say about investments and this is the overall problem and maybe we can um, move into the next kind of chat we have. I'll put it on the board and that's the overall problem that people have. Like they just don't know what to do. Like they're getting squeezed by, you know, cost of living crisis, housing crisis, all, all of this sort of stuff. So we talk about finding these positive geared properties, but they're, they're obviously not as easy to find as what people think. And if you're using too much leverage, you begin not to be positive because you're borrowing too much. People are looking for these alternative ways of of kind of achieving what they need to achieve to not spend their final years on a, on a government pension, which I don't know if you've looked lately, it hasn't, hasn't exactly been going up the last 20 years. Yes, yes. Yeah, a lot of people now are looking to to Southeast Asia and um, right. I've been playing a little bit in that area. So, yeah, maybe we should. Yes, you, you, you did promise me some some of your fascinating uh, research that you found out. Well, I'm not sure if it's fascinating. It's more, I think the viewers will like it more if it's purely coming from kind of this journey I've just kind of fell into. I started going in on, <laughs> I can chat about it when, when we chat about it, but understanding how different things are somewhere else in the world is crazy because we're experts in you know finance and property and all of that sort of stuff we, we've got a really good finger on the pulse of what's happening here in australia but you go somewhere else there's one thing understanding the actual property market and all of that but it's it's cultural things as well it's like well mm. how not to get scammed talking about structures and trying to get help there learning about the property market. They don't specifically have buyer agents over there, although they kind of do. Yeah, it's a lot different. But anyway, we can have a chat about that next time. What I found, what the challenges are, because I think it's going to be really good to talk about because actually I know a lot of people are actually considering this just because they're looking at their potential future here and they're like, I need a backup plan because if things continue to kind of get worse for their particular situation, maybe living somewhere else is actually a better better idea. In the early part of my career, I, I had a bunch of investors who were going into the States actually, into the sort of um, larger regional towns in, in the United States and buying up very positive cash flow properties. You know, a lot of them were during the GFC, so that 2009, where people were just, in, in the United States, you can literally walk into the bank, hand in the keys and walk out. Like it's, uh, it, we don't have that in Australia, but you, in the United mm-hmm. States, you can do that. And so uh, mortgage in possession was massive and they were just handing these properties away for not very much money, like 50,000, 80,000, 100,000 US. And they were renting it two, three, four hundred dollars a week, kind of a thing. So that was a fascinating process. I don't know a lot about it other than that and what sort of structures you would use. And then there's ownership laws in some countries where you can't own it unless you are uh, like a resident or a, a citizen of the country. So there's lots to think about in that area. Anyway, look forward to chatting about that next time we we'll chat. We'll expand that one out. Yeah. <laughs> nice. See how I go with that. Good to see you, Will. Thanks, mate. Bye, mate.